Hello, my name is Kugel Wangwa Upshaw, and I'm the acting director of the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation in Orange County, California. Thank you for inviting us into your homes this evening. And since the pandemic began a year ago, Zoom has become a part of our daily lives. This evening, we welcome our loyal members and new guests from near and far to the Library Foundation's virtual auditorium. What you need to know about this program is that we are recording it. And if you want to ask a question, use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. The 2021 season of Library Live is made possible by all the sponsors you saw in our slideshow, plus all our ticket holders, dedicated foundation members, the Library Live committee, Greg and Sally Palmer, Natasha and Todd Palmer, Karen and Bruce Clark, and Sam and Tammy Tang. Thank you all for going above and beyond to make our programs possible and to help us fulfill the foundation's mission of providing funds to purchase valuable analog and digital resources for the library. You make our library card a powerful tool for everyone who wields it. To find out more about the foundation, how to support the Newport Beach Library and to buy tickets for the upcoming Library Live program with author Stephen Rowley in conversation with Samantha Dunn please visit our new website at nbplf.foundation. Now, I'm excited to announce our speaker for tonight, Stuart Polly. Stuart is an amazing photographer who was born and raised in Southern California and has been documenting the California wildfires for the last seven years. His most recent book, Terra Flema, showcases the increasingly damaging effects of these wildfires on the landscapes and the outsized impact on people's lives. This is still fresh on our minds after witnessing the largest fire on record in California just last year. Pelly's works have been published in numerous publications, including recently in National Geographic Magazine and LA Magazine. Stewart's work was featured at the University of California Riverside Arts California Museum of Photography last year, where Douglas McCullough, who he will be in conversation with tonight, is the senior curator. Well, let me welcome Douglas. There we are. Good evening, everybody. Okay. Thank you for joining. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, Doug, thank you for joining us as well. Happy to be here. Excellent. So I think uh, for all our viewers, we're going to pull up a uh, little uh, slideshow here real quick that will uh, show some images in the background. And um, I'm just going to give a second for that to get started. But um, Doug, I, I, I think that uh, maybe we should give the audience just a little bit of an introduction sort of to um, the work you've also done with, uh, you know, the exhibit at UC Riverside Facing Fire that features some of this work and sort of the currency of this discussion within Southern California. So, um, you know, with that, uh, I, I guess, do you have any Oh, how would you say um, um, insight into fire as a whole and, and how it's been photographed here and sort of how this discussion maybe falls within um, covering climate in California? Yeah, the, the exhibition at the California Museum of Photography is actually still up. It's been trapped behind the walls, which is a little ironic for a, an exhibition on fire to be frozen <laughs> um, by the pandemic in a closed museum. So it'll open shortly. And if you live in Southern California, you can see it will we'll open mid-May. I think what's interesting, just as a very brief comment, and I think um, maybe a way to start, is that I became interested in photography of fire because it's a such an extreme form of photography. And it's so dramatic and so wonderful. And Stuart, you have a lot of photographs in this exhibition, but also because human beings, humanity is intertwined with fire. Fire, we rely on fire. It's the warmth of the hearth, it's cooking, but it'll also burn your house down. Mm -hmm. So it's one of these things where it's, it's elemental, we rely on it, and yet we've been watching fire after fire, the fires you've been shooting for all these years in California, really get extraordinary and kind of out of control, and almost a harbinger of climate change and a metaphor for mankind unsettling the balance of nature in some fashion. I don't know. Describe your engagement with fire. How, how long have you, you've been shooting for seven years? How many fires have well, you been? Well, we're, we're uh, and, and thank you for that introduction. So this will be my ninth season of photographing wildfire here in Southern California. And of course, 
both with this body of work, the exhibit, the Terra Flamma Wildfire book over the last nine years. And I think most people who have lived in California for that time and some time before have seen that we've had some pretty rough fire seasons the last few years, to put it mildly. And uh, with the current photo that's on display that I believe everybody can see, that is of the North Complex in the Feather River Gorge in the Plumas National Forest. And that was taken in early October of 2020. Uh, on assignment for the U.S. Forest Service. And to me, uh, a lot of what I try and do with the work is juxtapose the fire uh, with the natural elements. We have something here, just a regular, beautiful stream in the forest, contrasted by the, the brightness of the fire. So to me, I'm very much drawn to the combinations of um, the cool nighttime uh, uh, hues of the sky, the warmth of the fire. And this picture is largely illuminated both by the fire and a little bit of moonlight. So fire really is sort of its, its own light source. So um, next slide, please. And this is uh, that same image, but closer up in the Feather River Gorge. And again, you can see here how I sort of try and use the fire just to paint the image itself. This is a digital SLR camera on a tripod sort of propped up on the bank, river banks at about four o'clock in the morning. And uh, that's fire illuminating its own self reflected off the river. Then, of course, you've got the headlights of a vehicle there. So to me, I'm always trying to sort of capture the geology of a place, uh, put the fire in context of, of where it is. For example, this fire was in a rural area in steep terrain next to a river. So I tried to capture all those elements in this image versus, uh, you know, some images we'll see later that are more in what's called the wild and urban interface, uh, for example, in Southern California. Now, the wild and urban interface, or what firefighters call the Wooly, is an area where human development uh, meets the land, and that can be an urban area or that can be a more rural subdivision. Next I, slide. A, a real, a quick question for you. I know you have a master's in photojournalism from one of the best journalism oh schools gosh. in the country. Well, you know, I, I sort of got to brag on you a little bit. But so the question is, A, you know, did, how did that inform this shooting? And, but also, how did you start with fires? Because not everybody comes uh, to, you know, pursues a photojournalism career and starts chasing fires on an obsessive level like yourself. So how that's, did that's start? a great question. <laughs> well, uh, my interest with fires primarily started in the environment in general here in California. In many ways, California as a whole is a land of extremes, fires, earthquakes, floods, um, you know, rainy season, dry season. And as I was finishing my master's degree and working on my master's project, I focused on a place called the Salton Sea, which is in far south Riverside County and Imperial Counties. And it's a ecological disaster that has to do with the management of water, the appropriation of it and the misuse thereof. And as I was finishing that project up about eight or nine years ago, uh, California was entering the throes of a very serious drought uh, of which we recovered for a little bit the last few years, but haven't. And so basically growing up in Southern California, fire was on the periphery of my life. I mean, I remember vaguely as a kid, the, the major Laguna Canyon fire in what, 1993, 1994, and seeing the smoke here from Newport Beach and coastal Orange County. So, and you know, being on the dance floor in high school and having ash fall in October, uh, you know, I think it was the, maybe one of the Santiago fires in 04. And so fires, fires there. And I mean, I moved back here and fire kept happening and I was interning in a newspaper and I had safety gear and press credentials. And I said, Hey, I'm going to go out and cover this. And I sort of got pulled into it that way. And I was very much struck by this collision of human development uh, what at the time to me seemed like mostly drought, but also where we build and how we build. And over the last nine years, I've been to about 110 fires up and down the state. Um, you know, to me, there's there's also obviously climate change. We are in the midst of a major climate crisis here. Um, that's not to say that it's the sole reason this is happening. Uh, fuel loads, again, where we build, how we build, fuels management, uh, it's very nuanced. And I was having a discussion earlier today, actually, with a photo editor, and we were talking about it, and she said, hey, Stuart, does you know, can we put this all on climate change? And I said, yes and no. The answer is nuanced. Every fire is different. Uh, I view fire as a living, breathing entity. I mean, fire literally needs oxygen to complete the chemical reaction for combustion. So to me, a fire breathes and it has its own character. Sometimes it rhymes with other fires, but every fire is its own uh, beast, so to speak. So I try and assess every fire again in that way and try and view it as, as something to both be respected and feared and understood both for uh, the necessity of fire on the landscape here, but also the impacts it has on people's lives. So for example, this frame is the Silverado fire. Um, this is in uh, 
gosh, I always, I, my memory almost gets tangled with all the fires we had in Orange County this fall. This was in November and this was like 11 o'clock in the morning. This is a new housing development in the Irvine Great Park off the 133 toll road in an urban area. And there was fire bumping up against this development and these people were in their home. Uh, you know, and also this is during, right, in October when COVID cases are increasing in their stay at home orders. And they're literally having to run out of their house as firefighters are putting out embers in the decorative uh, mulch out there. So to me, these scenes of how everyday people's lives are upended residents, you know, I, I don't know if this was a mom with her kids. I She literally ran in her car and drove off. So I didn't get a chance to speak with her, but you know, family units or, or whatever it is being impacted by this and the firefighters escorting them out and, you know, running with just, you know, the, the girl with her, her little plush pillow and the boy with his, with his computer while they're fighting off the fire. And to me, uh, this is in our backyards. This is not some abstract thing in the Sierras. This is right here in Orange County, there are areas in Newport Beach that are high wild fire hazard areas, and we do quite a bit of mitigation, but there are areas in Newport Beach, Corona Del Mar, Buck Gully, um, Newport Coast, where I went to high school, Sage Hill School, that was built within the footprint of the Laguna Canyon fire in the early 1990s. So um, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when fire threatens those same areas again. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this one I had meant to put in at the end, but it jumped in here. So this is just a quick behind the scenes photo of me about five years ago to fire here uh, in the Los Angeles area. It was in the Angeles National Forest. Um, and it was just one of those days where uh, what is in the background, that pile of smoke you see is what's called a pyrocumulus. And essentially it is a cumulus cloud that is created by the fire that creates its own weather. And you get upward convection uh, that causes these plumes to reach very high. And eventually uh, if there's wind, they get sheared off or they get sheared off at about 20,000 feet. So, I mean, here in Orange County, if you get a big fire in the Angeles National Forest or Malibu, oftentimes you can see these from afar. And so this gives you sort of an example of my equipment setup, my safety approach. What I'm wearing is a no mix. It's a fire resistant fabric. Uh, this is the same equipment that wildland firefighters would wear. I have a hard hat helmet. I'm wearing a pack that has a fire shelter on it, of course, my camera, and then uh, I'm wearing fire boots that are uh, fire rated and custom built for wildland fire underneath, and I do carry uh, formal wildland fire certifications. I do contract uh, on an on-call basis for the Forest Service in the summer as well to photograph with them, so I'm fortunate to have that uh, training and experience because my approach at these fires is telling the story is important, whether I'm there working for the Forest Service or there as media for a newspaper or magazine. My priority is to be safe and stay out of first responders way. Uh, and then after I've provided for that, then I can make pictures. No picture is worth compromising my safety or that of a firefighter who's already busy enough. As long as we're on this and we're looking at your camera, we have we have a question in the Q&A. Sure. People, people can put more in, which is what make and model of camera do you use, which is you know, a, a photo geek question. For sure. You. Well, you know, uh, digital technology is so incredible uh, what these cameras are able to do. They're durable. So uh, in that image, I believe it's a Nikon D4 or a Nikon D810. So um, with this, that has a 70 to 200 zoom. Uh, but frankly, one of my favorite photos I took last year, I used with the long exposure night mode on my iPhone. And that was one that the Forest Service put out on their social media because I was able to send it to them quickly. And it went pretty viral. So I use the Nikon DSLRs because they have uh, magnesium alloy bodies. They're weather sealed and they're very rugged when you're dealing with ash and smoke. And I end up bringing up a pretty hefty repair bill every year. I mean, <laughs> fire and ash and smoke does not play well with sensitive electronics, but uh, that's just sort of par for the course in this field. Uh, next slide, please. And this is another image of the impact that fire has on uh, those of us who live here. So this is a gentleman by the name of Masao Barrows, and he's running out of his home at three o'clock in the morning in Thousand Oaks not even in the hills, in the flat area, not far from the 101 freeway, uh, about three o'clock in the morning at the Woolsey fire in November, 2018. And he was asleep with, and his roommate was there and the house caught on fire. And the firefighters basically said, just run down the street and get away from the fire. And he's there in his PJs. And uh, we later connected and he's actually somebody who uh, I interviewed for my upcoming book and uh, quite a little bit about his story and, and afterwards in, in those moments. And the house actually survived. Firefighters were able to save it. The front yard was beaten up. Um, his truck was a little burned. He lost all his tools, but uh, he survived. And, and he has a pretty harrowing story in all of his own. But I mean, these moments happen so quickly. This was over in five seconds or less. And it was just 
being in the right place at the right time. But to me, uh, in addition to some of the landscapes you'll see, which are sort of the more beautiful photos of fire, this also underscores the human impact that these fire has. I mean, people are losing their homes. And as we know, the cost of living in California is very high. And you have people's hopes and dreams and things they've spent decades for working for be destroyed overnight. And sure, you can rebuild, but you know, rebuilding is a lot of work. It's traumatic to lose your home. You might be underinsured. If you live in a rural area, you might be on a fixed income. And it creates a host of other issues that we're finding now in California. For example, the 2018 campfire in Butte County destroyed 35% of Butte County's housing stock overnight. 30,000 structures were destroyed in two hours. And that has many ripple effects. I mean, a friend of mine's grandparents, they moved to Texas. They just said, we're done with the Sierras and they moved. And it wasn't, it wasn't economics. It was more of an environmental issue to be totally honest. Next you know, slide, please. Lo Go looking ahead. at this one real quickly, I, I sure. would just say I, from uh, curating the exhibition that you're in, um, I happen to know that the Woolsey fire burned like 1600, a little over 1600 um, structures mm -hmm. and, and killed three people. And you're in the middle of this all the time. How does that affect you? I mean, we can move on to the next slide, but it's kind of sure. Well, I think that's brain. a great. I think that's a great question, and that's one thing that's taken me a number of years to wrap my head around. It is that, you know, I am there as an observer, uh, a chronicler, a documentary documentarian of sorts. But I've also developed very close friendships with firefighters. I see year after year, corresponding with people I photographed, uh, and in a way, it's been cathartic for them. Just because I've been there in an, an experience that's traumatic for them just to be able to share it with me and, and debrief with me. And uh, obviously this affects me pretty heavily. I mean, I've seen um, a lot of this very up close and personal. And uh, to me, it's very visceral. It's very important that this gets shared, uh, what the general public doesn't always get to see, uh, because this is an acute effect of climate change here in California. I mean, fire is very um, visual, but this is also, I mean, we had a fire in the Angeles National Forest last week, and I was listening to the fire, the, the radio, and they're like, the fire is going to burn into the snowbank. And I've never heard that before. And the way the forest was burning at this time of year, it's not unprecedented, but it is very uncommon. And I certainly have concerns about this year. And I think uh, anybody who was here uh, between September and October, especially Northern California last year, saw that when there was so much smoke over San Francisco that at 10 o'clock in the morning, street lights went on, office lights went on. And my uh, colleague, Jessica Christian, who's an incredibly talented photographer at the San Francisco Chronicle, made that powerful image uh, looking back over San Francisco at that. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, it affects me. I definitely have to take time after these fires to rest and recharge both uh, physically and emotionally uh, because it is, it is very intense. You're very much there focused on being safe and making pictures. But uh, like anything else, when you're engaged in an intense situation, you want to take time afterwards just to sort of unwind and give yourself the space. So when you go back, you can do good work and also be respectful to first responders and civilians and the stakeholders there. Because if I'm not on top of things or at 100%, then I'm not, I'm doing a disservice to the people who are trusting me or allowing me into their lives or firefighting. And that's a huge privilege and I wanna do right by them. So this image actually was pretty lucky. So this is Half Dome uh, in Yosemite, obviously crown jewel of our national parks. And this was actually a lightning fire uh, I photographed in 2014. And I actually took this from the parking lot at the Glacier Point Lookout overnight. I stayed there all night with my tripod and got this right before sunrise. And this has become one of my more well-known fire images. And I, I chuckle because I took this from the parking lot. So, you know, some images I'm out there hiking all day and I make pictures that aren't great or just, you know, some basic storytelling pictures. Other times I drive to Yosemite in the middle of the night and go to a parking lot and you have this view. So, you know, fire isn't always up close and personal. Sometimes I'm here, you know, eight or nine miles away with the zoom lens punching in across the valley to sort of get the whole scale of things. I, I love this photo. I mean, this is in the exhibition and it, it, it's so, I grew up going to Yosemite every single summer and my father as a geologist, you know, loved the high Sierras particularly, but so it's a really familiar place, probably a million acres of film in the day or sensors now have been exposed at this spot. It's a famous, famous view, Ansel Adams and many others. And I never would have thought, I mean, it seems sort of apocalyptic that there is like fire off the shoulder of Half Dome. I, th I think this is a wonderful photo. And, and again, going back to what I talked about with fire and the nuance. So uh, this fire was caused by lightning. It was a natural cause, but it did happen during 
uh, a pretty serious drought. And there's a lot of trees that have been killed from drought impacts in the bark beetle up there. So they were letting this fire burn as a managed fire in Yosemite to help restore the native balance of fuels. And uh, it just got hot and dry enough that the fire blew up. There were hikers on the route to Half Dome. They had to helicopter them off. And uh, they, they just kind of, then they decided, obviously they had to suppress it at that point because they didn't want it to burn down the whole park more or less. But, you know, there's this balance of prescribed burning, letting fires burn naturally in a managed way. But of course, I always say fire is going to do what fire wants. You know, we try and think we're in control of things and we're not. It's sort of the, the Titanic mentality. You know, it's an <laughs> unsinkable ship. Well, it sank. We can control fire to an extent we can, but ultimately at the end of the day, we're not always in control. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> This was at the Valley Fire, which was in San Diego. This was in September, and this night kicked off about three weeks of nonstop fire coverage at the, the uh, crux of our, our horrible fire season. And uh, this is a home in a rural area, and it was everything was a total loss. And I had to leave about 10 seconds after taking this picture, because if you see those bits of branches on that pine tree, they're starting to ignite. And it sounds like a freight train and you hear a whoosh and the entire tree goes up in fire. So I heard that coming and I hightailed it out of there. But, you know, this scene to me with this little VW bug in this outbuilding is just sort of this is someone's home. And, and it's it's just a strange suspension of reality to see people's places like this. But I mean, this was overnight. This was during a Santa Ana wind event at about 11 o'clock at night. And the flames, as you can see, are just being pushed out of this house almost horizontally due to those winds and extreme fire conditions. And I have goggles on, I have a respirator, I have a face shroud because this picture doesn't really show it, but there were thousands of embers blowing at me, which is why you wear all that safety gear. So what's the most dangerous situation you've been in? That's a great question. Uh, I like to think that uh, the training that I have lets me identify dangerous situations when they're forming before they become very dangerous. But 2019 at the Kincaid fire up in uh, Sonoma County, uh, the fire had died down. It was about 10 o'clock at night and some winds picked up suddenly. And within about five minutes, the fire had exploded. And basically I had to move where I was, leave an area, go to what's called a, a temporary refuge area to sort of let the fire do its thing and get out of the way. So, um, you know, basically it's, it's just seeing the fire uh, become more active in a way that it's basically coming towards you and you get the heck out of there, which is why I've, I've really tried to focus on fire weather, fire training, weather forecasts. And, and I always say with this, the best tool you have is in between your ears. It's your brain. It's situational awareness, being aware, being focused. And that's the challenge that I find is I'm looking through a lens, taking pictures, I'm listening to the radio or I'm driving. And then I also need to make sure what the fire is doing at all times. So I think that's one of the reasons fires can be so intense and exhausting is like you have to be fully on like you don't when you're at a fire there's there's no breaks like you're in and you're focused and then once you're gone of course then you can sort of rest next slide please <laughs> this is another image from this fall this is uh the bear complex or the bear fire which was part of the north complex this is lake oroville and to me this image captures drought issues water management issues and of course fire behavior. So uh, that bank in front of me used to be underwater a couple of years ago. And that's just as the water levels in Lake Oroville continue to drop. And if you look to the right of the frame, you can see where the vegetation stops and it slopes off. So that's probably a 60 foot water level drop. And this is the middle of the night. Um, I had an air quality meter there with me and it actually malfunctioned the smoke was so dense because it formed an inversion layer above the water as the night cooled but uh the aqi according to my meter was above 999 which is like far worse than the most polluted city in the world on any given day right, next slide now, this is a, a bit of a slower image. And I, again, this is like the parking lot from Glacier Point. I photographed this on a United Airlines flight when I was on assignment for National Geographic going from a fire in Oregon back down here to go to another fire. And this was at like nine o'clock in the morning and through the plane window just with a zoom lens. But this again shows, you know, um, um, how smoke permeates through valleys. I mean, for example, Bozeman, Montana, all of September, you could barely see the sun because of the way the jet stream works. Um, all the fires in Northern California blow into the Great Basin and eastward over to the Rockies. So uh, there was even smoke from these wildfires that detect had detectable presence and air quality impacts in Europe. So, um, and actually, uh, this 
issue of National Geographic, uh, April's issue, the cover story is on air pollution and air quality issues. And they were kind enough to, to feature a few photos from this assignment that I did for them that, that talks about this and, and how it affects wildland firefighters and uh, early mortality even here in uh, California. There's about 3,000 early deaths attributed to wildfire smoke here last fall. Now, what that is, is if people have, you know, um, an existing condition, asthma, COPD, heart disease, the combined with fire, it exacerbates, um, you know, their health conditions and can cause a, a, an untimely death. So, uh, you know, we know air pollution is hurting people, uh, but we're trying to find out exactly with these intense fires, how much that's also affecting us. So next slide, please. And then sort of jumping back into Northern California, this is a vineyard um, last fall up at the Glass Fire in Napa County. And uh, that whole area has been hit really hard by fires the last few years. And I had to leave this vineyard very soon after I took this picture because the fire was roaring up the hill. But to me, this is about putting the fire in context of the place in wine country, these vines, this harvest that's probably ruined. It's the fall. These are red grapes. I don't know if they're Cabernet grapes or whatnot. I'm not a vintner, but uh, you know, these, these, all these grapes are going to have smoke taint and you can kind of clean them up, but you're not going to be able to bottle it in your vintage and where wine and tourism is a huge part of the industry combined with COVID impacts. I mean, people are really hurting in a lot of ways. So to me, there's a lot of secondary and tertiary impacts from these fires that sort of go beyond the photos that these sort of, uh, I hope, uh, invites the viewer to look at it and look into the deeper issues. I, I think you're in the right business because uh, five of the six largest fires in California history were last year. I mean, you're, it's, you know, it's you're not last have year was just I I flew in. <laughs> I flew into Northern California late August when we had the lightning siege. I counted 13 different smoke columns and pyrocumuluses from the plane. I've never seen anything like it. I hope to never see it again, but I like to think I've gotten pretty decent at figuring out where fires are and what's going on. And there was so much going on. I could not even figure out what was going on. I couldn't, there was too much radio traffic. I just sort of had to go in manual <laughs> mode and just literally go drive to the fire and figure out what was going on on the ground. Like that. The, the information that was being fed to me was just so overwhelming that it was hard to parse it out while traveling. It's crazy. Next slide, please. And again, that's that same vineyard later that evening. So uh, I juxtapose these two photos to show how fire is its own light source and you can use the ambient light from vehicle headlights. Uh, so, you know, that's my headlamp in the foreground. That's a fire truck with the more blue lights. And then the orange in the back, of course, is the fire. So it creates these sort of surreal scenes that you would never even see uh, during a beautiful sunset, for example. This is a one-time thing here. What's interesting is you've, you're highly expert in night photography in general, and you sort of make it look easy with all these light sources, but it's actually really tricky. Uh, well, it, just, what, it what, takes what? practice. It takes yeah. practice. And I've always loved photographing at night. I love you know night skies, Milky Way, light painting in general. And I've been doing that ever since... Uh, gosh, I was in high school. So for me, all those years of experimenting, doing landscapes for fun, you know, school projects, other art projects, I think that experience helped allow me, you know, so I know, all right, I need to have my iPhone at half brightness for three seconds, six feet away from that post. And you just sort of get a feel for it and the settings with time. So people will say, well, what settings do you use? And it's, it's just sort of going off experience. But for those who are technically inclined, you know, I, basically use live view, focus the lens at infinity or on a point that I want to focus on. ISO 1600, four second exposure, maybe stop the lens down to F4, turn off image stabilization and, and let it rip and see how it goes and, and adjust from there. <laughs> and I, I, I have to say my, my iPhone light, the lighting and the color is so good. The night I will use night mode because in four seconds, I can take a handheld long exposure and kind of see what the picture is going to look like. And I use that as a sketch or to scout my formal camera photos at this point. So that's actually become a great creative tool to make my uh, life a little bit easier when I'm out there. I love that. That's like back in the day, photographers would shoot Polaroids as a test. <laughs> and you're like, use your iPhone as a test. It's, it's, it's true. And, and, and uh, you know, the tools that we have are so incredible, even since I started this, um, what these tools are able to do and what they're capable of. And ultimately it is a, you know, these are mechanical objects that are in the service of telling a story. But to me, uh, anything that helps you sort of push the envelope or the boundary of that storytelling is always a good asset to have. Next slide, please. So this is going back sort of to the beginning. This is one of the most early sort of dramatic photos I took. This was the Rim Fire in Yosemite National Park in 2013. I couldn't get into this fire for various reasons. 
Uh, but this is about 10 miles wide of fire. There's four components to this fire. Uh, if anyone's familiar with the Sierras and the, the Western Sierras, this is on Highway 49 between Mariposa and Oakhurst. And this is with a zoom lens for like a two minute exposure zoomed in, which is why the star, the motion of the stars are exaggerated there. And it's a two minute exposure. So you can see how the wind's just pushing the fire northward. And to me, again, this is sort of taking landscape photography, journalism, documentary photography, maybe even a little bit of art and sort of combining it all together. And the goal here is for people to say, hey, this is a pretty picture of fire. I wonder what's going on here. And again, like other pictures, invite the viewer to learn a little bit more about what's behind the picture. Next I noticed, slide. I noticed some uh, plane trails through it as well. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh. Well, just the being in the Bay Area, I think, too, and it's interesting, some areas are quiet, other areas you have quite a bit of flight traffic. And I think just because that was somewhat close, you know, to Reno and SFO, you get those, those trails. Um, so this is another one. This is also Yosemite at the El Portal fire. Yosemite's had quite a bit of fires in all the Western Sierras, uh, everywhere from Kernville up to Chico and further north into Oregon. You've just got uh, that area especially has been hit pretty hard by fire. So this is taken with a very long telephoto lens from eight miles away because I couldn't get into the fire and it's a four minute exposure. So uh, what I like about long exposure photography is your eye sees about one thirtieth of a second. So this is four minutes. So there are many orders of magnitude, uh, uh, much orders of magnitude larger of light being recorded on the camera sensor than our eyes see. And as a result, you get an image that is recording light over that period of time. And it creates these sort of just surreal scenes where it turns nature and trees into geometry and the fire almost becomes, uh, you know, this sort of phantasmorgic form uh, illuminating the hills. And to me, like I, this is probably one of my favorite images I've ever made. I don't know. I, I just, to me, it just, it shows a lot of uh, the topography, the impact on the fuels, the drought impacted trees, uh, the, the terrain that the fire's in. I, I have to say I agree with you completely, and in fact, the front of the museum, as you know, has a, about a 16-foot wide <laughs> version of this photo. It's fantastic, really. That's right. Um, well, thank you for putting that up, too, in such big print. It's always great to see that uh, out front and center. Uh, next slide, please. And again, this is another zoomed-in version of that wider half-dome shot that you saw. And again, um, you know, I do try and work different lengths, uh, you know, angles, uh, move around and and obviously with the technology that we have for digital imaging you can get a wide angle shot or you can really punch in like this and it totally changes the character of the picture and this picture was taken 10 minutes before that other half dome image so the difference here is there's moonlight uh, so that's why the clouds illuminated and that's why the granite on half dome is illuminated from above and then five minutes later enough clouds came in so it blocked the moon and then the fire glow reflected more off the clouds versus the moon so a lot of these moments are very fleeting and very quick. Next slide, please. Now, this is a picture where I'm trying to, to trying to show the wind and how embers spread fire. So this was in 2014 in Rancho Cucamonga at 10 o'clock at night. It was a really severe Santa Ana wind event in April. There were gusts over 100 miles an hour, which are hurricane force. It was so windy, aircraft couldn't fly. And this was at the end of the day, trees that had burned. And this is the 30 second exposure. And you can just see with every puff of wind, there's thousands of embers being blown everywhere. And I was standing in the midst of this. My neck got burned a little bit. It was, wasn't a big deal, but it was, was not comfortable. But you know, to me, this also shows how these fires are spread during wind events here, how all it takes is one ember under a deck or in a tree or in a pile of pine needles to, to make the fire continue to spread or what firefighters call spotting ahead of itself. You know, I'll, I'll just throw in a quick comment here, which is that fire has all these metaphoric meanings for, for mankind. We're so intertwined with fire. And one of them in the past year has, I've, I've seen a million epidemiologists, probably not a million, but a half a million, make the comparison between the virus and the spread of the COVID-19 coronavirus and these fires burning in a situation like this one you're describing, where there's 100 miles an hour wind. So what the sparks are is one person flying from Britain to New York and bringing the virus and then landing and starting a fire in some way. Like the, the embers are the carriers of the virus and the little spot fires are the spread of the virus. I mean, the spread of the vi of fire is really like the spread of the virus. And you see that a lot when you, you know, when you pay attention to fire as a metaphor. 
Well, I think that's a really interesting comparison you draw because a lot of uh, my friends who are in the fire world drew it. They, they said, you know, we we view this as like fuel and the virus is a fire and people are the fuel and we've got to try and create fuel breaks and stop the fire from spawning ahead of itself. You know, you can control a couple spot fires, but when you've got 20 spot fires over your bulldozer line or fire line, then it goes out of control and then it's just all, you know, all gone to heck in a handbasket. So, you know, <laughs> it, it's funny that you mentioned that because that was sort of discussed. Uh, as well, too, amongst the fire world. Next That's slide, nice. please. Uh, good yeah. to hear. And again, this is an image I don't think I'll ever be able to make again. Uh, this is Southern Sierra's 2014. Uh, I'm on an old uh, like stagecoach trail or something that they were using to fight the fire. And this is an aircraft that's flying around the fire to map it. So they've got the plane on autopilot and they've got the rudder sort of turning at a certain degree. And it's making a circle as they are, I have a camera in the fuselage or the belly of the plane shooting down to map the fire. And so to me, again, this is, you know, the road, I light painted with a very blue headlamp going into the scene, very wide angle lens tilted up to give you that perspective and sort of just drawing your eye into this, this surreal scene. So again, um, you know, if I can try and make visual order out of the chaos of fires, to me, that's a successful image. Yeah. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another one that uh, I actually, I have this on my business card and I have it framed outside of my office. This is a uh, Joshua tree, probably my favorite tree in the world, uh, threatened both by climate change in general and wildfire. And this is up uh, on Pipes Canyon Road near Pioneer Town. Uh, which is just outside of the park proper. And to me, this was about, the fire was actually a few miles away, but there was so much light and smoke coming up from the fire. The pyrocumulus or the smoke at night was illuminated by the glow of the fire. And, and so I was just really trying to get in low with the wide angle lens and take the warmth of the fire and combine it with those blue hues of the summer night sky. And then that orange is headlights from my car. So, um, you know, this is trying to show how the Joshua tree is endangered in this area by wildfire. And, um, in September of this year, the Dome Fire in Mojave National Preserve uh, burned 1.2 million Eastern Joshua trees. That's approximately 25% of the trees in the Mojave National Preserve. And uh, they are actually going to be doing some uh, plantings to help replant baby Joshua trees. And uh, they're looking for volunteers next fall. And I'll be out there photographing that and researching a little bit on stories on on sort of how you come back after that. And of course, like the desert ecosystem is incredibly resilient. A lot's gonna grow back. The problem is, is that Joshua trees and, and most desert trees grow really slow. And Joshua trees are adapted for fire, but when you have a running crown fire, uh, which is what happened at the dome fire, which means it's running through the tops of the trees and the trunks, they can't survive that. They can survive a low-key ground fire. And one of the reasons that happened is that there's more nitrogen being fixed into the soil, essentially air pollution from the Los Angeles basin. Um, there is in the pollutants, there's nitrogen, which is an, you know one of the, on the periodic table of elements. It ends up in the soil. It's more conducive to invasive grasses that burn hotter and faster than native grasses. So once those gra grasses, um, catch on fire, it, it's just a lot more intense fire to the trees. And then combined with it being like, you know, record breaking temperatures, even in the desert in September, it just creates these recipes for uh, extreme fire behavior. We, we, we had uh, Laird Hayes jump in and say, how do you sign up to volunteer to plant? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. I, I can follow up afterwards and send a link, but I was reading an article about it. But, um, you know, if you reach out to the Mojave National Preserve, there's, a, I believe, a nonprofit conservancy group that works with the Park Service that is organizing those volunteers to sort of help with some of the rehab uh, for that next fall. So I'll try and find out and find a link. But, you know, if you go to um, the National Park Service site for the Mojave National Preserve and go to their page where they have blog posts and news links, you'll see that article uh, that I'm mentioning and they might have a contact there where you can follow up. Great question. Next slide. Again, this is another one, just a strange suspension of reality. The sky is just this violet color. Um, this is 2015 in Lake County, which like two thirds of the entire county is burned in unpopulated areas in the last decade. And, you know, I don't know if this was someone's home or their like little RV cabin on top of a hill, but this had just burned an hour before the ground was still hot. The only thing, you know, you can see some melted chairs that didn't quite burn because they didn't have anything around them to light them on fire. But it was just so surreal. I mean, I had my jaw on that. Literally, my jaw was on the floor taking these pictures just with the light and the scene. It was just like something out of Mad Max. Uh, but this was reality. I mean, this was what was in front of me. So, you know, I, people say, oh, 
you know, I don't think this or that is happening, or I, I, I don't know how accurate this is, but, you know, it's hard for me to deny what I see in front of my own lens with my own eyes. I mean, this is, this is the reality on the ground. Next slide, please. This is another image sort of uh, showing how you don't always need to be up close and personal. Um, and so Lauren actually just sent a, a link to the chat actually that I think is helpful for people to learn about helping out in the park. So this is a panoramic image I took in Kings Canyon National Park uh, from a actual uh, fire lookout tower at like 10 o'clock at night. They let me go up there. And this is probably the fire's 12 miles away and it's three or four images combined and all those wispy clouds are what are called thermal belts or inversion layers. So 10 minutes later, the fire was covered in smoke. So this is as it cools down, um, the clouds and, and heat gets trapped in the valley and creates these crazy layers. So to me, again, this is a picture I love just because it shows the scale. And about two weeks later, the fire jumped the Kings River and made it all the way to this fire lookout tower, which will show shows you the scale of this fire that was 150,000 acres, how big they really are on the ground. <laughs> yeah. Next slide, please. And again, so going back to that Joshua tree image, unlike the other one where the fire was far away, uh, this is one where the Joshua trees were unfortunately not so lucky. Uh, this is up in the Mojave Desert near Kernville by Lake Isabella. And all these Joshua trees were killed in uh, this fire in 2016, the Erskine fire. And they're probably not going to grow back. Um, the conditions there were probably too hot and too dry for the Joshua tree to grow back and thrive. Um, the Joshua tree is a very highly adapted species to a certain elevation and temperature range and moisture range. Obviously, you can grow them on your own and, and sort of create its habitat, but naturally it's hard for them to grow back in areas that have now become marginal due to hotter and drier weather. Um, and to me, again, this is a very wide angle lens looking up. You've got the fire, you've got the Joshua trees, you've got the Milky Way, and it's just, to me, it's like something out of Dr. Seuss. Um, Oh uh, gosh, I can't, I'm blanking on the name of it, but the, the Lorax, you know, the Truffula trees and, you know, we're the, we're the people sort of, you know, taking over the environment. And these are sort of the, the trees that we're, we're trying to protect or hoping to protect in some way. This is a, a pretty dystopian Dr. Seuss, I gotta say. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, and if you, and I mean, you know, and he, he's not without his, his faults and his issues. And, and, and that piece to me, I think in a, a way is an allegory for uh, humankind's uh, uh, impact on the environment. And to me, this is almost a real life uh, manifestation of that story. Yeah. Next slide, please. Another M Mad Max dystopian image. This is Interstate 15. This is a semi truck that burned in the blue cut fire. The entire interstate was shut down for a day. And I stood in between the 12 lane highway with a it took side someone to take a picture just to be like, this is crazy. This freeway being closed is costing like $10 million of interstate commerce an hour. And what's weird about this is obviously the truck burned. The only thing that didn't was the exhaust pipe because that's. Um, you know, tempered steel or high temperature steel that doesn't melt at certain temperatures. So that was uh, sort of ironic to see, but you just encounter these scenes that just, you, you don't see them every day. Next slide, please. And again, sometimes the moments are quieter. This is one tree in an area that had burned a week before that was still smoldering and throwing off sparks. It's lit just by moonlight. I mean, that's just, and so to me, this is a very subtle uh, but there were some trees falling uh, that had been weakened by fire. So I couldn't stay very long. I had to leave very quickly. Uh, but to me too, you know, it's looking at the subtlety of fire. I mean, there's a strange beauty here. For this area, this was actually pretty healthy and good fire. You can see a lot of trees didn't burn, but it helped kind of with the density of vegetation because this is actually still too thick and too dense of a forest and it will probably reburn again. But for this, it had some good ground fire that was not too bad. All right, and then we're on to our uh, last photo, the slideshow, and then I think we can hop into questions. So uh, this closing photo, uh, again, is another one that to me sort of sums out how I try and place fire in the context of where it happened. So this is the 2017 Wine Country Fire Siege in Northern California. Um, you know, you've got the vineyard, you've got the fire coming down the hill threatening the vineyard, and you've got sort of the, the green and the orange just sort of uh, juxtaposing each other to kind of create uh, some geometry out of it. And uh, again, putting the fire in, in context of its location, uh, the winery has been 
the winery business has been hit hard. And so um, I've gotten to know a lot of people up there uh, who have been heavily affected by these fires. And what's interesting is, is wine growers are some of the most uh, up-to-date forefront people on climate change as far as making their properties fire-wise, building defensible space, having backup generators, solar power, things like that. So uh, I think that um, you know, uh, state policy or local policy can learn a lot from how people in wine country are sort of adapting to these fires. So um, and what I'd like to do too, after this chat, um, I do have like a little behind the scenes video that we can share with the audience. It's about two or three minutes long uh, that they can prove at their leisure afterwards. But um, Doug, if, if you want anything to add, please do. Otherwise we can jump into Q&A. Well, there are some questions. So, so here's one. What's been the biggest surprise for you in your career? Have you learned something you've learned about fires or people you've met through this crazy line of work? I think the one thing that's really been impressed upon me at fires is the resiliency of the human spirit. People who have literally just watched everything get lost or not sure if their house is still there or can't find their pet or separated from their family or, you know, sleeping in the Walmart parking lot because they have nowhere else to go. How, you know, obviously they're going through trauma and pain, but they're also optimistic. They're strong. They're resilient. You know, they're offering me a bottle of water when I'm like, you know, I've got Gatorade in the fridge in my truck. Like, can I help you with anything? And they're like, do you want a bottle of water? And it's like, this isn't about me. It's like, but it's, it's the, the kindness and the, the generosity of the human spirit and also firefighters and first responders. I mean, they're literally putting their lives on the fire line. You know what they do going back in after a fire on their own time to, to feed people's pets or put food out for cats. You know, the, the volunteers from the local ASPCA who go in and try and feed pets and get them in to get help if they've been injured or something. Just that, that human spirit of, of, of sort of um, adapting to these uh, circumstances has, I think that the thing that surprised me the most is I didn't quite know what to experience, but I think that that has really shown me how, how good and, and how kind people can be. Another question is about access. I mean, you've gotten into what, 110 fires or something. I, so I happen to know, just to add on to that mm -hmm. question, you know, so how do you get in? But I, I happen to know just the tiniest amount that in California, there's sort of special access and that the reason people like yourselves can shoot in California is that is that you're essentially allowed behind lines. Well, or, more or less. So it, What's the deal? What's so the deal? In, in California, there is a there is a law, and it's it's literally in the California Penal Code, and it allows credentialed media access to areas that are closed off to the general public unless it's an active crime scene. So, for example, that would be like an earthquake. Uh, a, for in this case, a fire or, you know, an area that's been evacuated due to a flood. And essentially that's something. So uh, there were some court cases that uh, created a precedent for this over the last couple of decades that said the public has an interest in having media document what's going on here because these are public employees on public payroll and a public function in a newsworthy event. And the public has a right to see and be documented. At the same time, that access gives us great responsibility. That's why I have the safety gear and the training. When you're in there, you're on your own. You know, if something happens to you, it's nobody's problem, but your own. You know, you get a flat tire, you get burned, you run out of water, you run out of gas. You're totally on your own. There's nobody there to help you. So you have to be very prepared. So people say, I want to go shoot fires or I want to go right along with you. But like, this is not, this isn't like an adrenaline chase. So sure, there's an adrenaline component to it, but it's, it's dangerous work. It's intensive work. It takes training and in, intention. And there's a lot at stake. And this is not something that I, I think anyone should take lightly. And with that said, you know, I think it's important that people document climate issues in their own backyards. But as you see in some of the photos I shared, some of my, I guess, most well-known photos or photos I'm most proud of, I've taken from miles away, not even on the fire line. So there are a lot of ways to photograph fire from afar as well. But, you know, we are very fortunate in California to have this access. And it's one of the reasons this project is so focused on California is other states is easier to embed with the U.S. military overseas than it is to get access at fires in some other states. So we have a library foundation uh, audience here. And so there is a question. Tell us about your new book. Sure. That's a great question. So I actually just worked on some edits this week and it's, it's going into some um, formal, more formal editing. So it is called into the inferno, a photographer's journey through California's wildfires and fallout. And it chronicles my journey as a photographer, both through my literal and figurative lens uh, from about 2012 to 2018, as I sort of grow as a photographer and a person and see fires become worse and say, Hey, maybe this is climate change and the stories of wildland firefighters 
um, other first responders, civilians, and climate scientists that I weave throughout the book. And it's sort of a combination of memoir, experiential, nonfiction narrative. Uh, and it's a written book uh, that tells my experience at these fires. So the stories behind these pictures, some of the crazier moments that when always, you know, be told by a photo that I felt needed to be told in writing. And uh, that's being published by Blackstone Publishers. And we're not quite sure on a date, but I'm, I think we're hoping maybe for spring 2022, but don't quote me on that. It's uh, still very tentative as we go through the editing process. And of course, with COVID uh, in this last fire season, things got pushed back a little bit. I think you should release it in fire season myself. Well, I you think know, the I'm plan is to have it come out at the beginning of fire season, I think, but, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see what they say. So here's another question. We've, we've got a, quite a flow of questions. Do you sure. travel by yourself or do you travel with others? Uh, I most usually travel by myself in my own vehicle because I'm usually coming and going from, you know, a residence or, you know, where I live in, in there. But uh, when I'm at fires, there's a couple of people that specialize on fires in certain areas. And uh, uh, Doug, you know, some of them, and they're actually in the exhibit, uh, Josh Edelson, Noah Berger, uh, my dear friend, Jeff Frost. And so when we're at fires, sometimes we'll caravan or at least send each other pins or locations or check in on each other to know where we are for safety purposes. But and, typically and I travel solo because the hours are really long and I'm the worst boss ever to myself. And I wouldn't want to subject anyone else to that, <laughs> honestly. No, I know. You talk about shooting at four in the morning. I figured if you're dragging somebody else along. I mean, <laughs> I've been up at every hour, asleep at every hour. It's, yeah, I mean, all nighters. I mean, if the Woolsey fire was up for 31 hours straight, safe for a nap in the back of my truck. So that's just, sometimes you got to go. And that's the thing. When the fire is moving, it's moving. It doesn't care what time of day it is. Another question is, it, over the past number of years, the wildfire season had just stretched out and stretched out. So how has your schedule and the nature of your work changed? What's a schedule? That sounds nice. <laughs> I'm kidding. But, uh, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, I have an idea just from the fires I photographed and when historically bad fires are, I have an idea of, you know, like September and October. So basically September 1st through Thanksgiving for me is totally blocked out for fires now. Like, I don't like that is high fire season here, but also July and August. I mean, fire season is year round in California. Sure, we have times where fires are more common and more intensive, but they can happen anytime, anywhere uh, here in the state. Uh, with that said, you know, I do read fire reports every day, uh, weekly reports. I talk to firefighters on the ground. There's reports that are made for fire departments that measure how dry fuels are in certain areas. Um, you know, I look at the small fires, how they behave and using my experience and talking to meteorologists, climate scientists, I can sort of get an idea. It's like, okay, you know, maybe I should have this couple weeks ready, or we know there's going to be a Santa Ana wind event or heat wave in September and the fuels are dry enough levels will they carry fire. And sort of with that information, I'm able to say, okay, um, I think there's a fire going to happen. For example, I was in Montana last summer writing my book at a farmhouse in the countryside, and I knew there was a heat wave coming to LA. And I'm like, this is, I got to go home and fire season starting. And I got back and two days later, it was nonstop. So, I mean, it's just kind of, um, for better or for worse, the timing was right, but it's certainly a lot of research on the back end too. So your lead career is photographer of fires, but you're also like a, a, a predictor of fires or something, a fire forecast. Well, I think so too. I think to, to photograph fires, you have to become a student of fire. And I think everyone that's a great wildland firefighter or somebody who's, who's in that world, they're primarily a student of fire. You know, they're always learning about how it reacts, uh, you know, how the world around them works in relation to fires, whether it's fire ecology, you know, how animals react to it, how humans react to it. Uh, you know, there's always something to learn. And, and, you know, with that, I've learned about weather, radio communications, geology, meteorol. I mean, it's, it's actually been a really interesting way in how it's opened up all these other areas, just in addition to solely photography. So what, what is it like to be on call? This is another question that came in, on call for fires. You're waiting for fires and then suddenly you, you rush out you're ready to go or what? What's basically it like? I just drop What's everything. If, if I, if I'm on assignment, I basically drop everything I'm doing and go. So there's two ways it'll happen uh, or three ways. The first of which is uh, if there's a big fire here in LA and I know it's going to be a newsworthy event, I'll just start going. And by the time I'm halfway there, I'll have like half a dozen phone calls of people saying, you know, can we bring you on for an assignment for a newspaper or magazine? Or, you know, I'll be working with, uh, you know, for example, Nat Geo, that was a three week assignment where, you know, we have this block of time and it's like, all right, here's what we're working on. You know, we do daily check ins. These are the focus that we're working on. And basically I make the call whether I go to that fire or not. And it's worth 
you know, something to cover for the story. And then the third way is uh, my contract for the Forest Service. So I'm basically a freelancer for the Forest Service. And how that works is I basically go in and do what I do for a newspaper or magazine, but I'm working directly for the incident in a large fire. And basically that's for the public record, for public information and for future training. And that's really cool because that stuff goes into the Library of Congress. Um, and that's something I'm very grateful for and something I'm really uh, proud of to be able to sort of document the men and women that are uh, out there on the fire line directly uh, with them. But yeah, I mean, I, I mean, that's something where they call me and it's like I get 24 hour notice for up to a two week commitment to go somewhere anywhere in the lower 48 for two weeks. It's kind of fantastic. You, you have this crazy fire obsession and you built it into a whole career. I, th I regard that as success. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's something that certainly I'm trying to find balance in the future, you know, work on other environmental issues, because obviously I'm interested in water and drought and in energy and infrastructure as well. But I mean, fire, it's, I, it's in some ways you can't get away from fire. It keeps happening. It keeps hitting us here and it keeps getting crazier. And I've, I've speak with other fire photographers about this. We sort of, you know, we sort of bought this ticket and we're on the ride, at least to a certain extent, you know, I think it's important to balance your own personal time and rest and other things. But I mean, as long as there's big fires going on, I'm going to try and document them as best I can and also help uh, teach the next generation of uh, storytellers as well. A question that I have is what do you, what connection do you see with this kind of extreme photography with war photography? Because I think there is some kind of affinity there. Well, there, there, it, you know, and I, I spoke about this too, photographer who's photographed in conflict zones from a newspaper and also photographed fires, you know, one hand, uh, you have the human element and there's people shooting at you. So the fire is not shooting at you and it's not the human element, but it's something that can be deadly. Uh, it's something where you, it, fire is organized. They fight fires like military. I mean, you have the fire in divisions, you have squads and crews, you have a base camp, which is a big logistics operation. And you have like a camaraderie of people who are experiencing this thing together. You've got kind of like your rat pack of people that you can kind of count on when you're there. So I think to that extent, there is a little bit of um, overlap, you know, it's kind of like there, there is, you know, it's like a Venn diagram. There's some overlap, but they're also different at the same time in my view. So we have obviously a fan. Can you tell us about the Subaru commercial? Which <laughs> <laughs> so the Subaru commercial, basically um, that started a couple of years ago and they actually reached out to me and they were doing a project on the reforesting campaign, which basically they basically partnered with the forest service to replant a couple million trees across the country where fires had been. And I said, Hey, that's a great idea. And I was like, you know, car company combustion engine, do I really want to do it? And I looked into it and I was like, actually, they actually did a lot of good work and it was really cool to go out, you know, on my own and see where they did some of the replanting. And I said, Hey, this is a really good opportunity uh, to get some of the footage and behind the scenes stuff I have from fires and get it out to a broader audience. So maybe somebody in the Midwest or the East Coast sees what we're facing here uh, in the Rockies in Westward. So uh, that is all footage. All the fire footage is real footage. Um, that's, and then they obviously they cut it together, but that's all footage, 80% uh, of it or something, almost all of it was from when I had the Outback. And, um, you know, except for the end scenes that was, and so that was a real privilege that they uh, were able to take those images and tell it. And, uh, you know, I, I got a lot of positive feedback from firefighters that were like, wow, we're glad, you know, people got to see a little bit of this too, in another way. Yeah. So don't ever get your uh, vehicle burned up in a fire because that would kind of be bad for the brand. And it, and, um, and it happens and it, ha it happens, not the Subaru, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> so here's, here's another question. Um, how do you think climate change will affect the landscape in California? And, and what do we need to do to deal with it? That is the literally the trillion dollar question. I mean, yesterday, the state legislature and the governor in California proposed an over a half billion dollar program uh, for grants for fuels reduction, uh, home retrofitting and other things in that way. It's going to be I mean, we have to treat the climate crisis now, hopefully that COVID is getting under control is like another war. I mean, this is the big climate change to me is the biggest threat to the well-being of America and the, and the world in general. I mean, when we look at these destabilizing effects. So what are the solutions? How does it affect the landscape? Well, um, you know, uh, where we build our houses, you know, we have to think about do we rebuild these houses in the forest that burn down because they're going to get hit again? Do we basically pay people to not move back? Do we rebuild the houses in a different way? Uh, do we put in a fuel break? Um, you know, obviously. Um, reducing carbon emissions and things like that. There's a lot of things that play into this, but it starts from an individual homeowner up to an institutional level and a political level. So, you know, what I will say on that is, um, you know, uh, a leader, we need leadership that's going to take this seriously. And to me, it transcends politics because again, fire affects us all. Fire doesn't care 
you know, what creed color, what you believe in, it, it, it is an equalizer in that way. Uh, not necessarily in how we're able to recover it as individuals, but when it hits you, nothing really matters. And I think we need to remember that when we go through this going forward. All right, one last brief question, which sure. is, do you think you'll always be taking photographs in the future? Uh, photographs in general, uh, most certainly yes. Fires probably, although you know, certainly I'll find a balance because I'm not getting any getting any younger. You know, when I was 24, or even versus 32, you know, those all nighters start to catch up to you quite a bit more as you get just slightly older. But I mean, I love photography. It's just a way I connect and see with the world, and it's a language for me. Um, but I'm also doing other things like writing this book. I'm working on a podcast. I'm building a cabin, and that's fun to do some carpentry, more tangible things that I can create versus a photograph unless you print it, which isn't always the most tangible thing. So um, yes, I'll always be photographing, but I'm also sort of branching out into some other creative pursuits. Wow, thank you so much. Well, thank you. And, and I want well, to thank, thank the audience, you. Doug, Kunga, and obviously the uh, Newport Beach Public Library Foundation for having me and inviting me tonight. Uh, my parents, who I think are listening, uh, Barbara Gladman and everyone else on the board and the donors and the volunteers who, who make this possible. You know, uh, local libraries are such an important institution in our, our civic society, especially now. And, you know, uh, we're very fortunate to have a wonderful library system here in Newport Beach. And I look forward to going back soon. And, uh, you know, I encourage you all, wherever you are, whether it's Newport or in your town, you know, support your local library because we need them now more than ever. Thank you so much, Stuart. And uh, thank Bob. you. Of course. That was incredible. And good luck on your book. Thank you so much. You Thanks back. for having me. Yeah, I hope you come back. <laughs> no, I'd, I'd love to be back. Thank you so much. Have a great night, everybody. Be safe All out right. there. Pleasure. All right, bye.